Good morning to all of you who are here today, as well as our online participants, and those of you who are going to be viewing this video in the future. My name is Rosie Stevenson Goodnight. I am the co-founder of a community called Women in Red. It's a community of OnWiki editors who create more articles regarding women's representation on Wikipedia. Their biographies, their works, their issues broadly construed. In this capacity, over the years, I've created dozens or hundreds of articles about 19th century temperance women and their works. I've uploaded hundreds of images related to the women, their issues, and their works, the temperance women. And while doing so, I've come to see some learnings from their work that has similarities to 21st century wiki women's movement. In my capacity as a visiting scholar at Northeastern University, I'm presenting some of my research here today. Let's get started. Barn raising, what is it? Historically, barn raising is a raising bee or rearing in the UK, a collective action of a community in which a barn for one of the members is built or rebuilt collectively by members of the community. This I see is what we are doing as wiki women. This is what I see 19th century temperance women doing as well. So how did the temperance movement begin? It was a social movement promoting temperance or complete abstinence from consumption of alcoholic beverages. Mind you, that doesn't include me. <laughs> Participants in the movement typically criticize alcohol intoxication or they promoted teetotalism. And its leaders emphasize alcohol's negative effects on people's health, on personalities, and family lives. Typically, the movement promoted alcohol education, and it also demanded the passage of new laws against the sale of alcohol, regulations on the availability of alcohol, or the complete prohibition of it. During the 19th century and early 20th century, the temperance movement became prominent in many countries around the world, particularly in English-speaking countries, Scandinavian, and major Protestant ones. You can see there's an exclusion of some religions here, but not all of them. It eventually led to national prohibitions, for example, in Canada in 1918, in Norway in 1919, in Finland 1919, in the United States 1920, as well as provisional prohibition in India in 1948. The temperance movement in the United Kingdom was a social movement that campaigned against the recreational use and sale of alcohol. It promoted total abstinence. In the 19th century, high levels of alcohol consumption and drunkenness were seen by social reformers, particularly women, as a danger to society's well-being, leading to social issues such as poverty, child ne neglect, immorality, economic decline, and so forth. Temperance societies began to be formed in the 1830s to campaign against alcohol. Specific groups were created over periods of time dedicated to different aspects of drinking. For example, in 1847, the Band of Hope was created to persuade children not to start drinking alcohol. The early temperance movement was inspired by the actions of Irish Presbyterian church minister John Edgar, who poured his stock of whiskey out of his window in, 19, in 1829. The first generation that promoted temperance was founded in 1829 by John Dunlap and, wait for it, his aunt, Miss Lily Graham of Graybard. Oops. 
Across the pond in the United States, the temperance movement was born with Benjamin Rush's 1784 tract, an inquiry into the effects of ardent spirits upon the human body and mind, which judged the excessive use of alcohol as being injurious to physical and psychological health. After this, 200 farmers in Connecticut and then similar groups in Virginia and then New York State began to form different kinds of associations. The temperance movement developed a large influence on American politics and American society. A myriad of factors contributed to women's interest, interest in the temperance movement. And one of the initial contributions was the frequency in which women were the victims of those who had an alcohol use disorder. Another contribution was related to the role of women in the home in the 19th century, which was largely to provide over the spiritual and physical needs of their homes and families. Because of this, women believed that it was their duty to protect their families from the danger of alcohol and convert family members to the ideas of abstinence. This newfound calling to temperance, however, did not change the widely held viewpoint that women were only responsible for matters which pertained inside their homes. Consequently, women had what Ruth Borden referred to as the maternal struggle, which women felt was their internal contradiction that came with their newly discovered power to make change. While still believing in their nurturing and domestic roles without yet understanding how to use their newly acquired power. Women who joined movements such as women's temperance organizations were considered pragmatic feminists because they took action to solve their grievances but were not interested in altering traditional sex roles. Missionary organizations of many Protestant denominations gave women an avenue to work from. Several all-female missionary societies already existed, and it was easy for them to transform themselves into women's temperance organizations. The temperance movement went from being just a social movement into talking about a specific problem, a specific issue. And the participants in the movement typically criticize something in order to discuss how this is going to improve the life of others. During the early 19th century, the temperance movement amongst uh, women were particularly English-speaking countries, Scandinavian, Protestant ones, and eventually Canada, Norway, Finland, the US, and India became highly involved. The Women's Crusade began in 1873 in the United States. It was a series of nonviolent protests fighting against the dangers of alcohol. It originated in Cleveland and spread to 900 different communities in over 31 states in the United States. It was led by Eliza Daniel Stewart, you see her pictured on the left, referred to as Mother Stewart. She began her career in public service during the American Civil War, working with the Soldiers Aid Societies, and it was there where she learned a few things about organizing. She visited the United Kingdom in 1876 and helped organize the British Women's Temperance Association. The Women's Christian Temperance Organization, the WCTU, was organized in 1873 in Ohio in the US. It was at one time the largest women's organization in the United States. The world's WCTU was founded in 1883, 10 years later, 
and became the international arm of the organization with affiliates in Australia, Canada, Netherlands, New Zealand, Finland, India, Japan, and so forth. After she was widowed and buried three of her four children, Annie Wittenmeyer, born in 1827, pictured on the left, served as the first national president of the WCTU. She was also the seventh national president of the Women's Relief Corps and served as the president of the nonpartisan national WCTU. Posthumously, Wittmeyer was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. Frances Willard, born in 1839, pictured on the right, served as the first dean of women at Northwestern University. For 19 years, she served as the second president of the WCTU. She was the founder of the world's WCTU. She was the first president of the National Council of Women of the United States. The British Women's Temperance Association, later renamed the White Ribbon Association, was formed in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1876, featuring American temperance activist Mother Stewart, who we just spoke about, pictured here is Lady Henry Somerset on the far left. Born in 1851, she spoke at the first World's WCTU convention in, in Boston and was the president of the British Women's Temperance Association. On the right, the Swiss Federation of Abstinent Women, Ligue Suisse des Femmes Abstinentes, was organized in Switzerland in 1902 by the Zurich writer and activist Hedwig Bühler-Wasser, together with the doctor Marie Heim Vogtin and the women's rights activist Clara Ragas Nadig. Azuma Moria, born 1884, standing on the left, was head of the Loyal Temperance Legion Program of Women in Japan, which served as the WCTU's outreach to children. She also served as secretary and traveling assistant to temperance activist Yajima Kajiko, born in 1833, seated in the photo on the far left who was the founder of the Women's Reform Society and president of Japan's WCTU. On the right, pictured is Heni Tekira Karamu, born in 1840, anglicized as Jane Foley after her second husband's surname. She was a New Zealand Maori. In later life, she worked in New Zealand's WCTU and was that organization's honorary secretary for the Maori mission of Rotorua. They weren't just activists, and they didn't only become organizers. They also became writers and journal editors. Lillian Stevens, born in 1843, pictured on the far left, helped launch the main state chapter of the WCTU. And after Frances Wheeler died, Stevens was elected as the third president of the national WCTU. She also served as editor-in-chief of the WCTU's organ, the Union Signal. In the center, Alafia Johannes born in 1863, was an Icelandic teacher whose ambition was to bring the women of Iceland to a position of equality with, with men. She traveled and lectured internationally on behalf of the Organization of Good Templars and the world's WCTOU. <laughs> she went on to become an author, magazine editor, and textbook translator. On the far right, Swedish journalist Emil Ratto, born 1862, was a newspaper editor 
as well as a temperance and women's right activist who founded the Swedish branch of the WCTU. Convenings. Here's plenty of them, but only some of them. It would be too many slides to show all the convenings that the women held. And mind you, when they held a convening, every speech that was made was written up and published in documents that we can see now in things like Internet Archive, if not Wikisource, if not Wikisource yet. Many publications, you see here thumbnail sketches of white ribbon women published in 1895. The Women's Temperance Publishing Association was a publisher of temperance literature established in 1879 in Indianapolis, Indiana. A concept of Matilda Carse, an Irish-born leader of the temperance movement. Designed as a joint stock company, no man could own stock as it could only be sold to WCTU women. Around the world, in so many languages, temperance women publish pamphlets, journals, magazines, newspapers, e essays, children's literature, convention reports, bibliographic compilations, almanacs, and more. They made banners, they made flags, they made medals. The banners and flags were held up at their uh, organizational meetings. They took them to their world's fairs, and they used them when they marched in parades. Designing and creating banners, flags, and medals was just one other way that a woman could serve in the movement. Temperance women's fountains can be found all over the world dedicated in various cities. The one you see pictured here is in Malvern, England. Photos and handwritten records aplenty exist. We have lots of them uploaded in Wikimedia Commons. And they built buildings. This, the Temperance Temple, served as the headquarters of the National WCTU, located in uh, Chicago. It was at a time when there were 200,000 women committed to the temperance movement and an additional 200,000 children, members of the WCTU's loyal temperance legions. Predating the temperance temple, the Willard, Francis Willard House in Evanston, Illinois, was a longtime headquarters of the WCTU. Built in 1865, today, it's a historic house museum owned by the National WCTU. The Women's Christian Temperance Union Administration Building, located in Evanston, Illinois, was the publishing house of the WCTU. It was added to the U.S. National Register of Historic Places in 2002. And now, we have six minutes left. What can we, 21st century wiki women, learn from 19th century temperance women? We've been uplifting them with the articles we write, the images we upload, the documents we bring into Wikisource. We've, we're taking care of them one by one by one. But what can we learn from them and apply to us today? I'm opening it up to questions. Someone's got a mic. We have a question. I have a general question. You mentioned, no? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that a couple of uh, non-English sphere uh, women who were active in temperance movement became also women rights advocates. Uh, do you know if it's true for, say, people in the UK, in the US, in other words, was there a uh, and significant overlap between 
temperance movement and women's rights movement. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll give you your $5 after we're done here. <laughs> Huge overlap. There were many women who had gone from being housewives to doing something extraordinarily different with their life. And the first entry was the temperance movement. And from that, they had their feet got wet. They then shifted into other areas. Some shifted into women's suffrage. And there were some splits. There were some people who felt that women who were active in women's temperance should just focus on women's temperance and not also be involved in suffrage. And others believed you can be involved in both why not? And from there, from women's suffrage, some of them got involved in the peace movement um, around the time of the First World War and extending into the Second World War. So there was a progression of these movements, starting with temperance, then suffrage and peace, that women, once they got into one, might have moved into another, or they just enter the suffrage movement. One of the things I shared with you is that it seemed to be kind of religion-based, um, mostly Christian religions, not totally, but mostly. So that excludes a huge part of the world. And with suffrage, it includes women all over the world in their different countries, and also those involved in the peace movement. So yes, there was a shift. What else helped with the shift is that we started traveling different. Back in the 19th century, we weren't flying. Women weren't flying to the conferences and the convenings, and yet they managed to do so. No internet, and yet they managed to, to communicate with each other. So as things progressed in society, it also helped them with how they progressed through the movements. I also have a question. Um, since the temperance is also related to health. I mean, women weren't allowed to study back then, but did they actually um, vocalize these health issues? Did they try to educate each other about the effects of alcohol, but also about other health issues that were beyond that? Or is there no connection to that subject? There wasn't much connection. There were women medical doctors who um, became involved in the temperance movement, and surely um, that would have been something that would have interested them. There was a, a department called Scientific Temperance, and that was the discussions regarding the health aspect. Um, each of the WCTUs had that department, but I didn't feel from the work that I've done that it was uh, so significant. Mostly it was societal to close down saloons, to get people to stop drinking, to stop drunkenness. I see here and then here. Uh, we have one and a half minutes. Two more questions. Okay, one oh. and then two. Okay, uh, I'll then just ask one. Uh, do you have any cooperation with uh, Wikiquote projects? Because uh, I, I'm working at Wikiquote, and, and I think it is very important not only to describe who the important women were in history, but also to uh, transfer their own voice. Uh, I'll give you your $5 after the session. I don't know how to do Wikiquote. But there are people who know how to do Wikiquote, and so let's shift some of this into Wikiquote. Those of you know, who know how to do it, jump in and start work on that. And then we have one more question. Okay. Let me run the risk of being physically ejected from the room. Um, many of the early... I do a lot of writing on Portuguese women. Many of the early um, feminists, temperance uh, women were... Upper middle class. I don't know whether that corresponds with your findings. Um, so maybe, uh, and they had tolerant husbands in some ways, who uh, uh, probably the building you showed in Chicago was funded to a certain extent by the rich husbands of these, fem uh, of these um, women. So what lesson that is for wiki, wiki, uh, women in red, I'm not quite sure, but I, <laughs> I, I just wanted to raise this point about the, the fact that they were upper middle class. You're right. There were women who were upper middle class who had rich husbands, and that was helpful. But by no means was this movement limited to those women. All um, uh, economic classes of women 
participated in this work. As for who built the buildings, it took money. And so, yes, it probably would have been uh, rich husbands who would have contributed to that. But all levels of economic classes in all countries, um, per women participated in the movement. Sorry, just two words uh, about the lesson in uh, man's planning. Uh, build alliances. Is the build alliances, yes. And thank you very much. <laughs>